Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, we have been reading a Carl Rogers on Becoming a Person, a therapist's view of psychotherapy. Uh, we are currently on page 164 um, in uh, chapter eight um, of part four. Um, and this is uh, to be that self, which one truly is, a therapist's view of personal goals. And last time we were here, we asked some questions. And so today we're gonna look at some of the answers. Um, and that's gonna start on um, uh, the bottom of page 164 and go through the top uh, the top third of page. Actually, it'll go through the bottom of page 166 and then we'll, we'll stop there and, and start again next time with uh, directions taken by clients on 167. So here we go, some answers. Before trying to take you into this world of my own experience with my clients, I would like to remind you that the questions I've mentioned are not pseudo questions, nor have men in the past or at the present time agreed on the answers. When men in the past have asked themselves the purpose of life, some have answered in the words of catechism that the chief end of man is to glorify God. Others have thought of life's purpose as being the preparation of oneself for immortality. Others have settled on a much more earth, earthy goal, to enjoy and release and satisfy every sensual desire. Still others, and this applies to many today, regard the purpose of life as being to achieve, to gain material possessions, status, knowledge, power. Some have made it their goal to give themselves completely and devotedly to a cause outside themselves, such as Christianity or communism. A Hitler has seen his goal as that of becoming the leader of a master race which would exercise power overall. In sharp contrast, many in Oriental has striven to eliminate all personal desires, to exercise the utmost control over himself. I mention these widely ranging choices to indicate some of the very different aims men have lived for, to suggest that there are indeed many goals possible. In a recent important study by Charles Morris, uh, excuse me, in a recent important study, Charles Morris investigated objectively the pathways of life which were preferred by students in six different countries, India, China, Japan, the United States, Canada, and Norman, Norway. As one might expect, he found decided differences in goals between these national groups. He also endeavored through a factor analysis of his data to determine the underlying dimensions of value, which seemed to operate in the thousands of specific individual preferences without going into the details of his analysis, excuse me, without going into details of his analysis, we might look at five different dimensions which emerged and which combined in various positive and negative ways appear to be responsible for the individual choices. The first such value dimension involves a preference for a responsible, moral, self-restrained participation in life, appreciating and conserving what man has attained. The second places stress upon delight in vigorous action for the overcoming of obstacles. It involves confident initiation of change, either in resolving personal or social problems or in overcoming obstacles in the natural world. The third dimension stresses the value of a self-sufficient inner life with a rich and heightened self-awareness. Control over persons and things is rejected in favor of a, of a deep and sympathetic insight into self and others. The fourth underlying dimension values a re receptivity to persons and to nature. Inspiration is seen as coming from a source outside the self, and the person lives and develops in devoted responsiveness to this source. The fifth and final dimension stresses sensuous enjoyment, self-enjoyment. The simple pleasures of life, an abandonment to the moment, a relaxed openness to life are valued. This is a significant study, one of the first to measure objectively the answers given in different cultures to the question, what is the purpose of my life? It has added to our knowledge of the answers given. It has also helped to define some of the basic dimensions in terms of which the choice is made. As Moore says, speaking of these dimensions, it is as if persons in various cultures 
have in common five major tones in the musical scales on which they compose different melodies. Another view. I find myself, however, vaguely dissatisfied with this study. None of the ways to live, which Morris puts before the students as possible choices, and none of the factor dimensions seem to contain satisfactorily the goal of life which emerges in my experience with my clients. As I watch person after person struggle in his therapy hours to find a way of life for himself, there seems to be a general pattern emerging, which is not quite captured by any of Morris's descriptions. The best way I can state this aim of life as I see it is coming to light in my relationship with my clients is to use the words of Kierkegaard, to be that self which one truly is. I am quite aware that this may sound so simple as to be absurd. To be one is to seem like a statement of obvious fact rather than a goal. What does it mean? What does it imply? I want to devote the remainder of my remarks to those issues. I will simply say at the outset that it seems to me, at the outset that it seems to mean and imply some strange things. Out of my experience with clients and out of my own self-searching, I find myself arriving at views which would have been very foreign to me 10 or 15 years ago. So I trust you will look at these views with critical skepticism and accept them only insofar as they ring true in your own experience. And end of reading for today. And next time we will start on page 167, directions taken by clients. So have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. And I look forward to reading with you again soon.